And it's an honor for me and I appreciate that uh, uh, very, very nice uh, alumni student from Australia is here and say, yes, uh, I follow my invitation to have a lecture on a very, very interesting topic. You know, I'm a fan a little bit from the split mouse design because in my opinion, uh, not from the statistician, they want to have mostly two groups with a lot of patients, but I think uh, if you have more or less the same shape of an implant, but it's one made by titanium, what we use for 50 years or more, and then for zirconia, and we have in the same patient, so the, we can compare it really nicely. And I promise him uh, if we have uh, a little bit more long-term data, it's much more interesting for us clinicians, yeah? Because he has a master thesis, and of course, a master thesis, he finished at 2015, yeah? Uh, 30 of September, yeah? Yep. There he was uh, the, um, the Master of Science of Oral Implantology of the Goethe University. Uh, he can't present uh, long-term data in this MOI Congress. Yeah? And uh, therefore, three years ago, we say, okay, you come, and uh, now the time is coming. He's here. We are really happy to hear about your results. Thank, Thank you, you for coming, Dean. Thank you. Yeah? Thank Thanks, you. Paul. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for listening to me. Uh, Homer today had a really, really nice lecture, so he's going to be a, a hard act to follow. But um, I'll just give you a little bit about what I did from not only my master thesis, but then on to a, a clinical trial. So the title of my, my talk today is The Clinical Long-Term Behaviour of Zirconia Implants and a Similar Shaped Titanium Implants. It was a randomised control trial with a split mouth design. So before I start, I want to talk about a few things of conflict of interest. So I declare that I don't have any conflict of interest regarding the presentation of my scientific study or in my presentation at all. I had no financial interest or funding from any of the mentioned products and I have received no financial benefits from any of the companies that I've mentioned. All right, so the implants and some of the components were supplied by Straumann just for the strict use of the study and with strict compliance protocols and they checked everything that I did. So, dental implants, well, Thanks to the pioneering work of Bronnemark, we all know that titanium surface facilitate osseointegration. Traditionally, titanium and titanium alloy have been materials of choice for implants due to their advantageous mechanical properties. Titanium implants have decades worth of data and they have at least 90, greater than 90% success. Huge database of ample scientific studies and quality research. So with such a successful track record, why are we looking for alternatives and why are we looking to change that? So if it isn't broken, why are we trying to fix it? So ceramics. Ceramics have played a huge part in dentistry from 1889 when they first um, had ceramic crowns, or ceramic crowns. So with high strength ceramics, they've been used in orthopedics for greater than 30 years. Okay, the push for all ceramic solutions has been a big thing, not only in Australia, but I'm sure worldwide, which is compounded and increased by the dentist no longer wanting metal metallic restorations, but it's also pushed by the patients. And in Australia in particular, I don't know what it's like in your country, but we have this huge subculture of the worried well where patients feel that their amalgams or any metal in their restorations, are, you know, the government's controlling them through that or it's going to make them sick somehow. So... It starts with the question. Zirconia was first introduced in the mid-80s as a viable dental material. And it started off as substructures for crowns and bridge and things like that, and then it progressed to transmucosal healing abutments. So obviously with logic, with the introduction of zirconia in the 80s as an abutment and, and as a dental material came the first ceramic implants. These weren't as successful as they are today. So with regard to zirconia implants, the, with the great success of the all ceramic and the all zirconia abutments, the next logical step would be all zirconia implants. Now, zirconia as a dental material works incredibly well, but it's not, but not only because of these things, but, and it's not limited to these, but superior plaque control as described by Diprec, the biomimetic aesthetics, the biophysical properties, so it has good fracture toughness, high flexural strength, and favorable modulus of elasticity. But more importantly, we're we are seeing some cases, albeit very little, of titanium allergy. So there's an issue where the, these zirconia implants have 
a more biocompatible, more biocompatible surface, and they are hypoallergenic. They also don't undergo corrosion with fluoride, which titanium implants do. And the BIC, or bone implant contact, is very, very similar to that of titanium. So, is the Coney implant going to work? Well, the new generations of Coney implants have been available to the Australian market since 2004. Now, there are numerous brands that have shown very good biocompatibility and the ability to integrate through a series of animal studies and clinical trials. Most of the one-piece implants, so they're a single implant with an abutment that's already built into the implant, and there's the, the crown is then fixated to that. Okay? But there is a risk. There were concerns with respect to risk of fracture and retrievability, and if you remove the crown or the crown needs to be replaced and you're cutting through it, as you go to break the crown off, do you break the abutment with it? So one-piece implants also present other limitations in the sense that the surgical protocol has to be on point. If you put the implant in incorrectly, you have no chance to correct your angulation. Especially with some of these ones, if you start to modify the abutment, you lose all warranty from the implant company. So despite the absence of micro gap, which is highly beneficial in maintaining bone height, the margin of the prosthetic restoration is usually still left below the gingival margin, and therefore cement excess, to which can be, well, obviously you need to cement the, the prosthesis, so cement excess can inadvertently be left behind and therefore cause an inflammatory response. So the question from my study was, are zirconia implants as successful as titanium implants with respect to hard tissue attachment, soft tissue attachment, and aesthetics? So we did a search of the current literature base and they found that there was no published data comparing hard or soft tissue attachment on both zirconia and titanium implants in humans, let alone in a split mount design. There was, we did another literature research and it did show that there were several studies depicting the difference between um, soft tissue attachment and, and aesthetics and the outcomes, but these were just abutments. These were not the full implant. So as part of my master's thesis, I did a pilot study. So the pilot study was a single-blinded, randomly controlled, um, randomly pers randomized prospective clinical trial. It was a split-mouth design, which means the implants were once one side got a titanium implant, the other side got a zirconia implant, and they had to be in the same position. So if it was a premolar on one side, it had to be a premolar on the other. If it was a molar on one side, it had to be a molar on the other side. It was left-right randomization through a randomization generator. Five participants were taken from my existing, existing patient database. They, they had an age range from 32 to 67 with a mean of 50.8. Three males, two females. Now, the most important thing for me that was so good about this study, which is thanks to Paul, is that we, with the exclusion, the exclusion criteria, we wanted to really reflect the community. So I did, the, these patients were, that were included were HIV positive, insulin-dependent diabetics, histories of cancer, smokers, lack of keratinized tissue, sorry Homer, and, and bruxism. They also had diverse ethnic backgrounds. Australia is very multicultural. And the methods against bias is that all treatment and data was collected only by the primary investigator, which was me. And the treatment quality and the results were externally evaluated. And we got ethics approval with, within Australia, which is incredibly difficult. So. Moving on to the full study, again, it was a single-blinded, randomized prospective clinical trial, split-mouth design again, left-right randomization, the same, but this time we had 11 participants from the existing database. The age range went from 32 to 75, so the mean moved to 59.27. Five males, six females. One was lost to follow-up with a total of 22 implants placed. Now, again, diverse range of medical issues, HIV positive, insulin-dependent diabetics, histories of cancer, smokers, previous perio, anticoagulant therapy, history of previous failed implants, and bruxism. Again, diverse ethnic backgrounds, demographic backgrounds, so we had patients that were not only from the city, but also from the country, and different socioeconomic status, and all of this was tabulized and, and documented. Again, ethics approval. The methods against bias is the same, and we're in the process of trying to publish at some point, right, Paul? 
when he enters his phone. So, the inclusion and exclusion criteria. So, inclusion, they had to be systemically healthy, ASA score of one or two, not pregnant, males or females had to be older than 18, mandible or maxilla was fine, they had to be healed, non-grafted sites. They, re they required bilateral implants in the molar or premolar region, but it had to be the same sites. Whether it was a six or a seven, or a five and a four, it didn't matter as long as it was in the same site because we felt that the bone and the gingiva in the area would be different if you're comparing molars with premolars. Okay, they had to have sufficient native bone to house a greater than 4.1 by 8 millimeter implant because both implants that we used were all 4.1 millimeter diameter, but whether it was 8, 10 or 12 millimeter length is the only thing that changed. The exclusion criteria was the presence of systemic or local contraindications. Patients with total edentulism, they required some hard tissue or soft tissue regeneration. If the implants did not achieve greater than 25 newton centimeters, they were not included. If they had some sort of requirement for an alveolectomy or some sort of bone modification, they weren't included. If the patient was to have a sinus lift, they weren't included either. And if they were on bisphosphonates or inadequate restorative space. We found that most of the patients that we were rejecting was because of inadequate posterior, uh, prosthetic space. So if we're comparing the implants, these are the two implants that we used. First one is a Straumann tissue level, it's a standard plus, which means that the polish collar is 1.8 millimeters high. Similarly, in the, in the Straumann pure ceramic, the polished area or the transmucosal area is 1.8 millimeters high. The, the titanium has an SLA surface, whereas zirconia has a ZLA surface, and they're shown to be very, very, very similar. Both of them were 4.1 millimeter diameter, but as you can see with the monotype Straumann Pure, it has an abutment which is already part of the implant. The only thing that really differed between the two implants was the thread design. Tissue level Straumann has a tissue level thread design like this. They're very small threads, whereas the, Z the zirconia one has a BL or bone level type uh, thread design. So there's a lot more threads and they're a lot more aggressive. So what we did as part of the study, at the time of placement, a solid abutment was placed. So the surgical protocol, all patients had to have a signed, signed consent and patient information sheet, a cone beam, thorough medical history and dental examination prior, initial plaque indexing, bleeding on probing and CPITN not only for the implant site once the implants were in, but also for the full mouth. Pre-surgical records were taken and all our models and things were taken for a surgical guide, which is made by Simplant. Allocation of randomization, which was through the randomization generator. All surgery was performed with guided osteotomies only. All implants were installed manually and hand torqued, which means that I put them in by hand, not with the motor, and then torqued them down by hand again. Standardized radiographs were taken at the time of surgery. And the implant position, length, insertion torque, and bone quality was all recorded at the time of surgery. This is a Simplant guide that, that we had. As you can see, it fits, it's obviously made just per one patient and facilitates fully guided osteotomies. With the zirconia, we would have done the, the implants fully guided, but at this time, the zirconia implants were not able to be placed through the guide. Across the board, the patients were D1 to D3 quality of bone. Across all participants, in fact, only one had D1. So, the insertion torque for the, tit for the titanium, the mean was 30 to 35, whereas, sorry, for the zirconia and for the titanium, the average was 25 to, to 35. And I think that can be largely attributed to the fact that they've got very, very different thread design. In fact, that what we found that Majority of the time, when we're putting the, the titanium implant in, it went in very, very easily, whereas the, the binding of the bone to the zirconia was very, very high, and more often than not, we had to back it out and do something like a tap before we could put the implant in. It binds, binds very, very, very quickly. There it is with the, uh, there's a titanium one placed with the solid abutment. Okay, so implants, like I said before, were installed manually. They were placed so that the roughened surface was completely encased in bone, leaving this smooth polished surface that you can see here. There's, it's very, very difficult to see, but there's a, there is a small transition line, and we left the smooth collars extending transmucosally. That's what they look like once they were in, and we used monofilament 
sutures across the board. Prosthetic protocol. Implants were reviewed at three months, and the restorative phase was commenced on the same appointment. All solid abutments had a talk test prior to impression and prior to cementing, which means that I ensured that they were at 35 newton centimeters before I took the impression, and then again before I cemented. The implant impression was closed tray, which Strauman has the ability to put. Uh, once you put the solid abutment, you can still do a closed tray impression over the top, and the closed tray was done with the PVS, which is Aquasil Rigid and XLV. Crowns were made by the same laboratory using the same material, which was zirconia. All crowns were tried for fit, color, and contour prior to cementation. All crowns had to be cemented bilaterally on the same appointment, so you couldn't have one if the fit wasn't quite right. You couldn't send that back. They had to, be, they had to go in on the same day. Crowns cemented using the extra oral technique as taught to me by Dr. Weigel. No retraction cord or paste was used to not, so we wouldn't disturb the soft tissue attachment. All crowns were bonded with the same cement, which was Reliax Unisem. And all crowns were checked for excess cement using the DG16 probe from Hugh Freddy. So, with respect to the results, 12-week healing period, reviews at three months, six months, one year, and three years. Periodontal probing deaths were measured with both the click the whole click probe and the ProDen RX, which is a sensor probe, which I'll show you in just a moment. Evaluation of survival success, mobility, peri-implant infection, pain, radiographic evidence of failure all taken. Standardization of photographs to assess soft tissue aesthetics. The review of the plaque index, the bleeding on probing and the CPITM was done. CPI, sorry, the probing depths and the, the plaque index and the bleeding on probing was done for the whole mouth and for the implants individually. Standardization of, of radiographs to evaluate marginal bone loss, pre and post loading. And we did a visual analog scale of the evaluation at six months, one and three years. Statistics were completed externally by a university medical stati statistician. So, standardization of radiographs. What I did was I got this RIN system, and before the, the, implant, before the crown went on, I would have um, PVS bite. I'd get the patient to bite on it, and then I'd take the x-ray at the time of surgery, and then again three months later. And what I would do is I would then keep this bit of PVS in the same box with their surgical guide, and all their bits and pieces and kept it all together. And then similarly, once they'd been restored, we used, we got the same thing, same PVS, same system, and then we keep that for, for the whole three years. You can see during the two periods, we changed from one material to the other. We just found this material to be a lot more stable and strong, and it was easily, easier to carve. This one was a little bit more rubbery, so it had a little bit more give. These are the probes that we used. The Hawk Click Probe at 25 grams, this thing moves and makes a little click. The ProDen RX is 20 grams, and then you stop when the two pieces of plastic touch. They're a little, a little bit more difficult to use this one. This one's a little bit more user-friendly, but the graduations on this one are not as easy to read as this one. There you go, there's the implants that were placed, the titanium and the zirconia. And then again, titanium zirconia after, you know, after some time. The mean periodontal probing depth for the ceramic was 2.04 versus ceramic versus titanium, which is 2.26. There you go. There's a preloading PA at three months, and then again, we found that preloading mean marginal bone loss from ceramic was 0.16 millimeters versus titanium, which is 0.46 millimeters. Postloading. Mean periodontal probing labs for ceramic was 2.11 versus titanium, which is 2.32. And the marginal bone loss was 0.21 versus 0.51. Now, the one thing I will say is that when it comes to probing, I, th I think there could be some margin of error because we make biomimetic crowns so that they actually look like teeth, but your probing angle has potential to change. So therefore, I think that can skew the results. If you really want true results, you would need to have a cylinder that would be in full occlusion, and that way you could get the probe down vertically as you would when you were first doing the probing for the non-loaded implants. That would be my biggest criticism of, of this study design. Post-loading results at six months. There's the periodontal probing charting. Photographs, there's titanium implants versus the zirconium implants. We had controlled aperture, shutter speed, and manual focus for all of them. Um, I've since found out that 400 is probably a little bit too high, and that's why the photos appear a little bit dark. 
You can see around the titanium implants for some of these implants, they are, uh, there is a little bit of a, a gray hue around the gingiva, but I think that is also dependent on the thickness of the, of the soft tissue. And similarly, again, I found that we had this gray band around a lot of the titanium ones, whereas the zirconia ones were not, not too bad. So I think also the photography in this, in this study was probably my biggest letdown. So the bleeding on, bleeding on probing results, we used the modified bleeding index as described by Mombelli in 87. The average BOP was 1.2. Plaque index, again, as described by Mombelli in 87, average plaque index was 1.0. There's all the plaque indexing over, that's the overview of all of them. What I did in the, um, in the final study as opposed to the, the um, pilot study was we used this plaque indicating gel. And what I found was the results of the bleeding on probing and the plaque indexing were skewed by two patients. So everyone was consistent across the board. Everyone's um, bleeding on probing and plaque index did not increase throughout the whole study except for two patients. And that it steadily increased. So every single time it increased, so therefore it skewed the results. So perhaps statistically we need to think about a different way of evaluating that. So you, these are the actual two patients that were quite bad. Um, this guy wasn't brushing his teeth very well at all. And this one here, the plaque is just quite old. This is greater than 48 hours with a pH less than 4.5. But funnily enough, when you put this, even, uh, even if you put them in these people's mouths, but they do have a lot of plaque retention on the implants. There was very, very little staining and that could be just attributed to the fact that the zirconia was so highly polished and glazed and therefore the plaque's not sticking to it as, as efficiently. So the result summary. The implants placed, we placed 22 implants, we had zero failures, we had zero complications. We did have one patient lost the follow-up, so she, um, we put the implants in, she came back for review, and then she didn't come back after that, so she didn't even get them restored. I don't know what she's doing. So implant length ranged from 8 to 12, with a mean of 9.09, .09. majority of that we used were 8 millimetres. Mean insertion torque was 33.18. Mean bone quality was D2. Um, the mean periodontal probing depths over three months for the ceramic was 2.04 and titanium is 2.26. And that seemed to steadily increase over the six months and then the three years. And I think that could be attributed to the fact that um, the implants were re-establishing biological width and the fact that um, the probes could be skewed a little bit in the sense that um, the, the bulbous nature of the crowns. Similarly, I think that if I'm going to critique this study one more time, is that the probing was left, there's, a, there's an element of human error that comes with periodontal probing. So just, you know, the angle that you hold it is not the same every single time, which is why I think that the cylindrical type of um, restoration would have been better, but it's not really going to work. Patients don't really want a cylinder as, rather than a tooth. So the mean, mean bleeding on probing and plaque indexing increased with every review. Like I said, it went from 0.3 to 1.2 over the three-year course, and plaque indexing went from 0.3 to 1.3, but that was largely due to the change in the only the two individuals. The modification to the protocol between the pilot and the full study was the measurement of the teeth periodontally. Essentially, I, what I wanted to do was I wanted to establish what was a base for that patient, what was the base periodontal probing depth for that patient across their mouth, and then judge what was normal, and then measure the BOP of the mouth and the implants as individuals, whereas in the pilot study, it was all lumped together. Same with the plaque index, and the plaque qual measuring the plaque quality based on the indicated gel. So, in conclusion, whilst titanium is still the material of choice for dental implants, I think the data from this study, albeit very small, shows that zirconia has proven to be a very successful competitor in the implant material of choice market. And I think it's, you can have zirconia implants for most clinical situations, although not all. Don't shy away from zirconia implants, just choose your applications and choose your patients wisely until such other time as, um, as otherwise proven. Now, the most, or sorry, the definitely there's requirement for further clinical research to verify and elucidate the strength and flaws of zirconia implants as an alternative to titanium, especially in the full arch forum. A lot of patients ask for zirconia implants and they need full arch restorations. At this point, I'm not comfortable placing full arch restorations on zirconia implants. 
definitely not the one piece. So, if you're going to integrate these into your practice, like I have, be very, very well aware of the clinician or the clientele that you will attract. Because a lot of patients, like I mentioned before, the worried well, that will seek you out and they will um, give you a little bit of grief. So, where to from here? In recent times, there's been a race to create a sturdy two piece fixture, which has avoided the shortcomings of the one piece, mostly the cement retention. A two piece zirconium implant that's not dependent on cement but features retrievability in the absence of breakage. So you can see this is one of the two, current two-piece implants. It has a dowel. When you put the abutment in and twist it, it locks in, but you still need to put cement inside. Now, there's a Swiss implant brand that's released multiple versions of the completely metal-free two-piece bone-level implant with both an internal and an external connection, and it looks very promising. This is their data, although I believe it's internal data, so I don't know how skewed it actually is. Straumann and Nova Biocare have quickly joined the race and they are releasing their own versions. In fact, Straumann should be releasing theirs in December and Nobel has taken this brand and just rebranded it as their own. Perhaps new research can be done to, show, to expand the boundaries of what is achievable with zirconia implants. I think they're, they're really, really good. I think they've, they've definitely changed my practice a lot, but I'd like to see what's possible with respect to immediate implantation and grafting and things like that. With respect to acknowledgements, the research was supported by Straumann for the provision of implants and some components. I'd like to thank Paul Weigel for his input in the study design and the original master thesis supervisor. I'd like to thank uh, Straumann, particularly Lutzi Obama, who had a lot of input in the study design and the help commissioning ethics, which was the biggest thing. Uh, ethics approval took me nine and a half months. And I'd like to thank my staff and family very much. So. Thank you very much for your attention. I know I speak very quick. Do you have any questions? Yeah, I thank you very much. Very professional. Thank you. I I'm think proud. the downside of speaking too much is that they uh, no, 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 it's more time okay. for questions. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. So the discussion is open. Do you have any questions on the, this uh, research? And also uh, about clinical questions, how to deal with this uh, zirconia implant, what is different to titanium? Where are the risks? Where are the similarities? Very nice presentation, I must say. Um, just a little question. It's like you mentioned in your um, one slide that the average was D2 bone. How did you uh, calculate the bone density? And for a sink plant, it gives you an opportunity to have a look at the bone quality. So it is a rough estimate at best. Without doing a medical CT, it is impossible to really determine the quality of the bone. G'day, mate. How are you going? You're coming next. Be <laughs> careful. <laughs> Um, I don't have much, any experience with zirconia implants and the few times that I've uh, sort of been interested to venture into it, um, I was led to believe that they require a much longer healing period as well as uh, protection through some sort of splint through the healing period so that there's absolutely no micro movement. Um, what's the latest on that and uh, how are you confident to restore it three months? Do you know what? In hindsight, we had zero failures and I've placed well over 100 of them. But now, I agree, I don't actually protect them. So I, I didn't do a SX or anything like that. But I am leaving it longer for the restorative. I'm waiting in the mandible, I'm waiting four to five months as a minimum. And the maxilla, I'm waiting at least eight months. Why? Why? Because it makes me feel better. I don't want to do the surgery twice. But uh, do you have the experience if you don't wait so long that well, you I have more? All the study ones are done at three months. In mandible and maxilla, and we had zero yeah. problem. Can I interfere on that topic? As much as you like. Okay. He make a very decisive uh, decision in his protocol. <coughs> the point is, uh, he say he never use the handpiece. He always make it by hand. It means he make very slowly, not 25 repetition per minute like we have yesterday. You miss it. <laughs> uh, it's uh, very, very slow. And therefore, there is no big heat um, at the interface because uh, Holger Siprich uh, and his staffs and, uh, and investigated if you place a zirconia implant with the same repetition per minute with the same in an in vitro setup, yeah, you have much more heat on the bone interface. 
And that's the reason that the tesson, the, the necrosis of the bone, is thicker and it takes a little bit more time for healing. This is the theory behind. We have not a, a big study situation, but he make a very decisive point placing a cer a ceramic implants. He used only his hands for placement and therefore it's very atraumatic for the bone. Yeah, because you know, zirconia has no heat conductivity, nothing. It's uh, very, uh, f very fast heating up. The guys that are putting in by, by motor are using cooling. So some of the guys, there's a, a guy in uh, Boston, Paul Fukuzada, he's putting them in, but he's using cooling. Shield failing is going on the implant as it's, as it's going in. I don't like that because it's washing the blood away, mm -hmm. but Pete's doing it. Yeah, right. But you'll find that because with the these kind of implants, it says not to put it over thirty five at all. And what will happen is you find that it binds really well, and you end up having to back it out. And it's not one of those implants that you can back in and back out like like you can with some of the other implant systems. You have to take it out. You have to tap and you put it in. But you don't want to tap first because then if you put it in, all of a sudden you have a thinner, you're going to have problems. Yeah, you need the new Austin to meet. Okay, next question. Yeah. Th thanks, thanks, Matt. They were very nice. Um, through your study, did you have any sort of uh, exposure to the histological part of things? No. Like how not. Okay. Did you actually, the second question will be, um, did you measure the second stability before you restore with an ostil, say? Do you know, I wanted to do that, and that was part of our original design. But there is no RFA unit that will allow you to test mm. zirconia. Yeah, there's, there's, there's no, uh, so there's no adapter. We, we looked at period test, mm. we looked at um, Ostel, and there's nothing that will allow you to use to, to, that RFA. Because even if you use the thing that clips on, it has some movement in it. So it gives you false readings. I think it's just going to break the bone contact, even if it's <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> even with like secondary it. step. If it's stable and you use resonance, it's probably going to fail too. Well, I don't Oh, Kannst yeah. du ihn schon mal anschließen, damit wir Richtung weiterkommen? Ah, okay, cool. Thank you. You join the party tonight? Then you ask more questions with a glass of beer. Seri, thank you very much for this nice study. So now, now I give a promise uh, to Dean uh, with a lot of witness. Yeah, we now will publish it in the next two months. Okay, we submit the manuscript. Is okay for you? Okay. So and uh, please, I want to handle over you the certificate for your lecture, for your office, and we have some photos. So please give him some hands. Thank you very much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. Okay, okay, we see us. Yeah, okay. Good, then I continue because uh, not to run again out of the time because he makes very nicely 25 minutes. The next speaker at the same day, his graduation at uh, 30 of September 2015, he's coming from Canada and he's uh, one of the most uh, motivated ambassador of the MY. Thank you very much for that. But this is not the reason that we invite him. <laughs> uh, he's also a good clinician and uh, he's meanwhile a good speaker too. It's Michael Gillis. Is the right pronunciation? Gillis. Okay, I never, I, it's only Michael for me. Uh, we have family. And um, yeah, the point is um, none of the lectures I see before because as we start this MOI Congress and we start to bring in the students and the MOI alumni. I always want to see the lecture a little bit ahead uh, to give some advices and so, but you are now adult, yeah? you don't need that. <laughs> so I'm really uh, eager to hear what is this new protocol yeah, for uh, edentalist chores, yeah? surgical and prostatontics, new protocol for fixed restoration. Yeah? So I have only in mind yeah, the last one was 15 years ago. It was all in four, yeah. So um, we will see what is new. Okay, the, what is the innovation, champs? Michael, the stage is for you. Thank you very much, Paul. I think that the greatest impact that the MOI program had on my actually, hang on here to get this. Uh, here we go from start.
Here we are. Um, I think the greatest impact that the MOI program had on my professional life is that it helped me to think more. It helped me to think more clinically, and it helped me to think more scientifically. It, it helped me kind of challenge ideas or challenge concepts or workflows, which in the past I just accepted. It helped me kind of think not so much outside the box, but as if there is no box. And uh, over the years, I found that there were particular workflows that may have challenged me more than others. So, some workflows where, uh, despite the fact that I felt I followed the, the conventional uh, approach, that I would still maybe not have an outcome that I expected. In particular, the one that, that for me was the most challenging was a full arch restoration. Uh, from surgery right through to rest, or from surgery through to restoration, um, I found that, and as may, may perhaps some of you have found, that it doesn't feel too good at the very end to have that screw that's just not passive, uh, that last uh, fixation screw, or or to find that your occlusion was way out in left field, or the aesthetics weren't quite you wanted. So I thought that maybe there's a way that we can apply the principles of kind of a prosthetically driven workflow from start to finish using the best aspects of digital workflows, and I, I rely a lot on digital workflow in my practice, but I, I feel that digital workflow doesn't completely do it all. But we do rely on digital workflows to, 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 the, to maximize their impact, but also pick up some, uh, some very important analog procedures within the workflow. Oops, it's easy. How do we work this? Ah, there we are. Okay. Um, over the years, we have, as time's gone on, we've got good literature on the success of, uh, of um, immediate loading with full arch cases. Uh, this uh, study uh, by Papa Spiridakos had 13,000 implants uh, over 2 to 15 years, uh, 62 studies, and showed 90 to 99% success rate. And again, uh, Niedermeyer as well showed a very, very high rate of success with immediate loading, 97% with four to six implants over time. Uh, this new workflow, and it's, it's lacking a name as of yet, this is the, the introduction. And what I'm going to present today is kind of the, the Monaco Grand Prix version of the workflow in, in, uh, with respect to the time that we have available. But the, I guess broadly, the, 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 uh, to break the workflow down, there are the categories of steps, I guess, are the same as with any workflow. Uh, diagnosis and treatment planning, we have our surgery and PMMA delivery. Uh, if we achieve uh, primary stability, that's adequate. If not, then we deliver denture. Fine-tuning our PMMA provisional, and then we uh, take our final records and deliver our restoration. So within the diagnosis and treatment planning phase, we do a, take a number of records, uh, a very, very detailed clinical examination and a cone beam CT. Uh, Impressions, whether they be digital or excellent, excellent quality PVS, jaw relation records and photographs. Now today I'm, I'm discussing the full arch upper uh, workflow. I've got workflows for the lower arch um, and also for the edentulous patient as well. We, with the models, we pour or print. We, we print or pour two sets of models. If we do pour the models, we ask the lab to digitize them, scan and print them. We mount both sets on a semi-adjustable articulator. Uh, then we cut the upper teeth off one of the printed uppers. And that'll, the reason for that will become, become clear uh, as we go on. We initiate the planning of the case in three-shape uh, three implant studio. Now, this is something that, that clinics may not have, but labs may have. So yeah, if, you, if you choose to, to attempt this type of workflow, uh, you know, it required the participation of, la of a lab with the software. So this is a case where, we, where we're uh, looking at four implants. We set it up as we conventionally would with the implant studio, assuming each of the implant teeth are abutment teeth, and we set up the remainder of the teeth as pontics. And it's also important that uh, three-shape implant studio comes in a number of different versions. It has to be the version that's configured with, uh, that's integrated with dental system with the rest of the software. Because what you have to do is, as in, in, in the next step, is to push the restorative design through the software. We virtually extract the teeth. Uh, it's important to take in the upper arch a, uh, a digital impression. And I use the, the trios in the office, um, a full arch uh, impression, including the entire palate 
being very, very careful to, to look for butterflying of the image. You need to get a, a, a clean image uh, because our, the fit of our PMMA provisional and the, the checking of that's going to rely on a good scan. I like to work in the kind of the bust stone version. I feel I can see contour better and I can assess the quality of the, uh, of the scan a little bit better. We also take, take a very, very detailed set of photographs. Um, we use these photographs to help us establish our restorative target. If we see that the midline is correct, we keep it. If we see that the incisal edge position is correct, we keep it. And we, we kind of use that data together with the data from the clinical examination to establish our restorative target. And uh, so there's the, there's the workup uh, in Implant Studio. And the reason I use Implant Studio is because you have tremendous, tremendous restorative design tools within the software. In fact, they're the same tools that are in the laboratory side of the Crown and Bridge software. So this is a case, this, this particular patient, those front teeth were short. Uh, they had, a, uh, you know, in one of the sets of models that, that from which we didn't uh, take, the, uh, take the teeth off, we, we checked the occlusion and looked at what the occlusal, occlusal reality was with that case. So we, when we propose changes, we only make changes that'll, that we feel will work. So here's, now how do I run the little movie here? There's a, this is a little, uh, have some here. Is that going? Yeah, so this shows kind of the fading in and fading out. So when we virtually extract the, the teeth, we're able in Implant Studio to kind of toggle in and out of the, uh, the pre-treatment and post-treatment uh, pr proposals. Then we can take teeth away and uh, see where we are. Sometimes I'll extract posterior teeth first. There we go. Um, so there's the proposed arch um, restoratively. So when I have that, that, when I get to this point, what we do is we, we, we figure out what our implant positions are going to be. We have to be very, very careful to, to be compliant with accepted principles of, of restorative design. We need to put our implants so that we allow enough vertical restorative room to allow our multi-unit abutments, so, so that we leave enough room for materials. So we find um, very rational implant positions and then we, from that, will predetermine angles of multi-unit abutments. And we design our surgical guide. So this is an all-in-four case. And I've done these cases partially guided and fully guided. I've used a number of different implant systems. Uh, um, as of the last few months, I've been doing these cases pr uh, exclusively with Straumann because I find the fit is exceptionally good. The multi-unit abutments that Straumann has are great and they've got a really good multi-unit abutment level scan body, the reason for which will become apparent in a little bit. So there's a printed guide. I print my guides in-house. I have a Stratasys printer, but these, certainly these steps can be, can be tackled by, by your dental lab. After the guide is designed, we push the implant studio restorative plan through to the remainder of the, of the three-shape uh, 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 prosthetic software. We, and then at this, at this stage, we have to trick uh, um, the three-shape software. We modify the prescription to be two abutments and 12 pontics. That's not what our plan is, to do that. But we have to do that so that we can design an exaggerated prosthetic gingiva to cover the palate. And that gingiva serves as a positioning index uh, for the positioning of the PMMA provisional. So this is how we, now how do I do this little pointer here? Uh, oh, shoot. There we go. Uh, so the gingiva serves as a position in the index, and I'm um, not sure how to use a pointer on this. Top one, okay. There we are. Thanks. Thank you. Um, yeah, so we, we modified the design. This may be tough to see, but there aren't any teeth in the second molar positions, but we pretend there, there are, and we call those just crowns. So we set it up as a conventional crown and bridge case, calling the second molars crowns and all of the rest of the teeth pontics. And that lets us unlock the feature for gingiva. And then what we do is we design an exaggerated, grossly exaggerated gingiva. This is just how it turns up in its default position. Then we kind of, we uh, toggle or we, uh, we design parts of it away. 
we mill that 14 unit provisional in PMMA, then we cut off the back two units. We index and screw that onto the modified upper from the beginning, but we cut all those teeth off. So that restoration gets screwed onto the, onto the mounted model, and then it allows us to do some occlusal adjustment on, so that we can go into the, to the surgical situation having a restoration that's gonna have a better chance of being, being quite close to where we want it to be. So then we also mill the hole or drill the holes into that uh, provisional to allow pickup of the temp cylinders uh, onto the multi-unit abutments. So there's our milled, it's kind of not a, not a great photograph there, but this is milled PMMA with the exaggerated palatal contour. This is it seated on that model where we had all of the teeth, the upper teeth uh, taken away. And this is how, oh, this, oh, shoot, uh oh. This is, um, this is how well adapted it is. I use, the pink is, uh, is a fit checker that I use to see how well it fits. So I keep adjusting a little bit so that I, that I get it to fit perfectly. Because I was very, very confident in that initial scan, um, and because st stuff just fits so well with the TRIO scans, I've, I go into these thinking that this, this is gonna fit quite well. Uh, soft tissues in the palate are very well bound down. Some people may say, well, you're scanning soft tissue. How is that going to be supportive? Well, palate seems to not be a problem. Um, so these are exclusively supported by the palate. When I, as an aside, as I do, when I do lower cases, what I do is I pre-extract all the back teeth up to the first premolars, and then I use the uh, distal extensions to, to seat the uh, provisional. So there's the PMA provisional uh, screwed onto the model, and I can check excursions. I can kind of compare that to the digital representation. Uh, then we move on to surgery. So we come, we're coming into the surgery uh, equipped with a milled PMMA provisional. I also will have made a full arch uh, a, a denture, just a conventional denture. Now the flanges on that denture are very shallow because what uh, the trios won't do is register mobile tissue. So I know that it's very, very shallow. Out of, I think, 12 or 13 cases I've done so far in the upper arch, I've only had to use the, uh, uh, the denture twice, I think. Um, but it, it's in both cases, it worked well. But with a, with a chair side hard reline. So we take the teeth out, uh, place our implants. Uh, we resect the bone as needed and graft as needed. And then we decide if we've achieved adequate primary stability, we'll uh, place our PMMA provisional. Uh, if not, we'll place the denture. I've done these cases with uh, uh, anywhere from four to six implants. I've not done more than that because I found that it's, you know, I've done conventional cases with as many as eight or 10, but I, I find it's hard to find optimal uh, places to put implants when I, when I boost the number of fixtures. Uh, so I placed the predetermined multi-unit abutments, and this is a step which in the conventional workflow I'd always struggle with because I'd have these, I'd, I'd get a, you know, 30 or 40 multi-unit abutments in a, in a box, and I would just choose the ones that would, that, would, uh, that would seem to be the ones I'd want to use. There's a lot of trial and error. But with this, I come into this surgery knowing that I'm going to use a 17-degree multi-unit abutment that's uh, you know, 2.5 millimeters tall. So that, that's all worked out uh, beforehand. So then that PMA provisional, provisional is indexed off the pallet, and I pick up the TEM cylinders I use build it FR because I find it has a great dual cure uh, property. There are other materials that you can use as well. There's, the, there's a surgery. Uh, this one's a, uh, just a partly guided surgery. Uh, so teeth come out, implants are placed, bones resected, and the case is grafted. I, I place the implants uh, first before I do bone resection because that's all worked out in implant studio. Then very carefully, I level the bone. And for that, I use rangeurs. I use files, and I use uh, judiciously burrs. Uh, here are the, the this, is, this case was done with uh, MISC1, which again is an also a very good implant, and they got a great multi-unit abutment level scan body. So these are the, uh, these are the, the carriers for the multi-unit abutments. And it's, it's very reassuring to see how parallel they are, because I've been on the other side of the fence where I've had them not so parallel. And this, I find, has worked, certainly has worked very well in my hands. There's the seating of the PMMA provisional indexed off the pallet. Uh, and it's looted in place with uh, the, the cylinders are picked up with builded FR. 
then from, from there, the next step is to take that provisional out after you've looted it. We fill in the little, the, the voids or the, any holes that we have. We cut off the palatal index, and then we work on the pink aesthetics and the pink contours. So I use cool liner uh, and gradia gum to dress it up. I adjust the contours and occlusion, and I seal the openings to the, uh, to the temp cylinders. So these are some, some cases. The two on the left are actually quite young. Uh, the gentleman on the far left had advanced adult perio. And these are the provisionals. These are, this guy is the day of, uh, he's the day of surgery. He looks a bit bleary-eyed. Um, he's the day of surgery. This lady in the middle had Shogun syndrome and, uh, and had, uh, I think, 17 root canals and recurrent caries. And she's in her mid-30s. Uh, and this, uh, this lady uh, on the far right, she lost her teeth to caries and periodontal disease. So that's just a case where some implants are placed. Um, then over the ensuing few months, we, we contour the provisionals and we make sure that we get things that are occlusally in the, you know, uh, valid and we work on the aesthetics and we do that over one to three visits typically. Uh, you know, we're setting aside a bunch of time to do this, but people have been coming in and geez, there's not that much to adjust. Then our final records. So at this stage, consider what we have. We have a restoration that's been present in the mouth. We've worked out the aesthetics, the phonetics, the occlusion. Uh, we have everything kind of, and we have a restoration that's, that's perfectly passive because it was picked up. So what we do is uh, for final uh, records day, we, we uh, take imposing models. And this is where I believe in this kind of workflow that the analog approach works better. Take opposing impressions, photographs again. We take the provisional out of the mouth. And we inspect for complete integrity of those uh, multi-unit abutment copings because they have to be perfectly intact. Uh, once we determine that they're intact, we do a light body PVS wash inside the provisional because we're not going to register the implant position. We're just going to register the soft tissue healing. And we seat that on just by hand on the MUAs. So there's one of the provisionals uh, here. I paint some tray adhesive inside. I do a wash impression. That's just a mounting stand for my face bow, opposing model and dry relation records. So what the lab here has, and we send all this to the lab, what the lab has is something, it's a record that's perfectly passive. You know, I've, I've in the conventional workflow, I've gone through all the verification jig steps. And despite that, I would sometimes find non-passivity. But with this, we're giving the lab, all of this goes physically to the lab. Uh, the records, the, the provisional, everything goes. And then the patient goes in a hole for about three or four hours. So you have to work with a local lab. In the lab, the, they prepare the master model. And what they do is they put multi-unit abutment analogs into the model and they, they uh, into the uh, PMMA temp. So the analogs go into the temp and they pour the, the temporary restoration as a model. So they get a soft tissue model, a hard model, and then they mount the whole works on a semi-adjustable articulator using the Facebook that we, that we provided them. So here is the, uh, I mean, these are, you know, these are quite parallel. These are, there's an, another all in four case. So we use a, this is, you know, and I do a lot of these first steps myself now, but uh, the, I have a local lab that's, that's, that's working with me to, uh, to pick all these up. Uh, and there's the, there's a master model. So with the uh, four perfectly passive abutments. And I haven't had any non-passivity yet with all the ones I've restored so far. Uh, in the lab, the provisional is duplicated using the cocoon technique. In that uh, provisional that they, uh, when, after they pour it up, they make sure that it's fully passive in the model and they make sure that the, the, the replica fits on the model as well. The lab returns a PMMA provisional to the clinic for reinsertion. So a delivery, the, the delivery of these is actually quite easy because, you know, I, I was setting aside two hours or three hours early on just for, you know, adjusting occlusion and polishing. But I found that because the PMMA had been so well worked out and I was giving the lab really good records, I was essentially taking one restoration out and putting another in. So it was really quite easy. Uh, so we verify the occlusion uh, verif uh, and adjust as needed, phonetics and aesthetics. Um, and uh, there's, a, uh, there's a restoration on the articulator. There's a final model. And, um, and within the photo, I'll go back to the photographs a little bit. Within those, that photographic survey that we do, you want to really pay attention to the smile line where 
you know, we want to make sure that, 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 that we don't display that, that horizontal boundary. So those are things that we look at when we, when we plan the case. There's a, uh, there's a finished, uh, finished case. And there's a comparison. That's the provisional and that's the, uh, that's the final. These are, this is the individual on the left. Now, you know, in, we have some people that look for pretty white teeth sometimes, and I always try to dissuade them a little bit. But uh, this was the, this guy. This is the guy with the uh, kind of advanced saddle perio, and there's his final situation. And this is a, this is a, uh, a local biker that had gone for, this was an edentulous workflow, actually. And he had gone, I think, 20 years without wearing anything. But he did come in with his bag of dentures that he couldn't wear. And uh, the day that we had to take the PMMA provisional from him, he almost cried because he was so happy because he had teeth for uh, he hadn't had teeth for such a long time. And just to review what what the steps are in the clinic, we we perform our detailed exam and take our records. Then all those records go to the lab, and then with 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 uh, careful communication with the lab, they'll fabricate a guide, mill the provisional, and 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 um, uh, prepare a backup denture. Then the day of surgery, we take the teeth out or if needed and uh, place our implants and deliver a PMMA or a denture if we don't achieve primary stability. The lab can attend to help you with the pickup and finishing of that, uh, the provisional. Uh, then for over a few months, the restoration is adjusted as needed. And then the last step, you know, three or four months later, we take the records, which for this workflow, take about an hour at most, and then we deliver the, deliver the case. Um, the lab does require the restoration in there possession for several hours uh, for the step, steps that they need to do to, uh, to finish the final or to finish the, uh, the, the records to make the final. And that's, uh, that's pretty much it. So that's uh, a... Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. So um, yeah, the discussion is open about okay. the new protocol. Um, my first question, sorry for that, is uh, do you have any kind of uh, thinking how much time you can save on your chair if you Ch compare to yeah, other I, protocols? I would say chair time with this workflow is, I would say, tw uh, 25% of what it was before. And uh, it's, it's. So you save uh, 75%? I would say, yes. The okay, the I think it's uh, worth to try it because um, yeah, no, yeah. you are and I faster in, in, the, in the time yes. where you treat your patients, right? Yes, indeed, yeah. The, uh, okay, so first question from Dean. Great talk, Mike, thanks. Just two quick questions. One, how long are you leaving the temporary in, in place for? Uh, ge uh, generally three to four months during the healing. And thank you. And second question is, what's your final restoration? Is it zirconia or is it uh, That's a hybrid? very good question. I knew somebody was going to ask that. Uh, it can be anything, really. Uh, I've been using monolithic zirconia now. Um, I think that the, um, you know, with veneering ceramics, but that's one of the complications with this, any workflow like this, full arch zirconia workflow with veneering ceramic, because these mechanical failures happen. So if, if you put veneering ceramic on these, then, then you can chip, chip the porcelain. The alternative would be to use a high translucency zirconia, but just because of the, the, the kind of crystalline microstructure of those, those are prone maybe a little more to breakage too because the crystal lattice is more organized and more prone to fracture. Another question, yeah? Marek? Yes. That's a very good question. And the answer to that question is yes. I have had complications. I have had PMA fracture. Um, and that's, luckily, the fractures have been, um, been a kind of lucky breaks where they've broken um, in the small short cantilevers that I've had. And uh, what, what I... Um, it, they're very repairable, though. So I would sometimes, in, the, in fact, the case, the final restoration that you saw, the, the, uh, the gentleman uh, on the far right, on the right side, his broke. And uh, uh, I, I built up a bit of composite uh, in the back uh, just for smoothness, and then we carried on. In the lab, based on the records that we had from the beginning, the lab was very to able to deliver the zirconia restoration uh, uh, at, at the end without it. 
No, no, I haven't lost any implants yet. I've been only been doing this workflow for about a year and a half, but so far things have been working, working, working well. Um, but and also to add to Dean's response, you know, you, there's no reason why you can't use other materials for this workflow. You could use, I mean, I, I'm very excited by the potential for, for uh, with pec pecton and Emacs, or you could use this workflow to make a hybrid. You're not limited in what you, you know, you make your final restoration out of. You can use anything you want because the lab has that perfectly passive model that's, uh, that I've worked so hard in other workflows to, to get. This, is, this has been very easy. So there's yeah. no indexing. So you can put in the workflow different materials and so the, the main point is the workflow. Right? The main, yeah, exactly, yeah. So, question? A couple of questions. Um, regarding the cantilever, you mentioned that microphone. you've had most of the fractures near the cantilever. Give me your question because we don't understand you. Yeah, so you mentioned the cantilevers. Yes. Um, and this is the area where you had most of the fractures. To what extent were you comfortable with extending the cantilever within the PMMA provision? I, I do short cantilevers. I don't do very long cantilevers. Uh, I know that there's literature that says, you know, 1.5 to 1, but mine are less than that. Uh, the electomy following implant placement. Yes, I do. When you do a long implant, you're drilling longer into bone, so you're probably generating a little bit more heat with a long implant passing through the area that you're going to have the electomy at the end anyway. Have you found any problems with crystal bone loss? Or I, I haven't. Uh, I haven't at all. Uh, not yet. Uh, but that's certainly something that certainly bears consideration. But um, it's, uh, yeah, that's certainly worth, yeah, worth keeping in mind. I have a question uh, regarding the amount of uh, bone. Uh, uh, how, how would you decide uh, before you do anything how much bone are you going to cut out of that? Oh, as far as how much resection to do, I look at the the smile line number one, and I look at the the needs for the for the uh, uh, the restorative needs of the material. We're going to place your implant. This is going to be the. Well, in implant studio, I can see the reference of the the where the teeth are, the the uh, kind of yeah, gingival margin. This is on the uh, positioning. Uh, I mean, uh, you're planning to cut a little bit of yes, bone, right? Where do you plan to place your implant? Here, or here, or here? Oh, I, on the on the uh, before when you're planning. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I think the principles that we use are the same as with uh, uh, digital planning conventionally for for any uh, guided surgery. But I, I I I guess I use a combination of a number of factors: the the needs for the of the material to have enough restorative space, but also Aesthetic needs. I don't want that boundary to be to be visible when the patient smiles. So I look for generally 10 or uh, 12 or 13 millimeters of, of height off the implant head of material. But I think that's just a conventional approach for zirconia. Okay. Again, we have to continue the discussion in the evening. Sorry. Great. Thank you <laughs> very, very, very much. Very Thank good, you. Thank you. Please come. Um, we. I want to handle over you the. Oh. Very yeah. Good. This is for your office and for your CV. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for coming. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We want to sell the program too. <laughs> uh, give him some head, yeah. You know, this is a Thank lot you. of work to make this kind of lecture. Thank you again. Thank you. So now I have to the pleasure to announce the next speaker. He's also an MOI student, but not an alumni. Uh, he tried to get the alumni soon. Oh, uh, there you go. He's coming from Argentina and uh, originally is born, I think, in Italy, right? Okay. Yeah, Italian citizen. Okay, sorry. And this is Gustavo Mugnolo. Yeah, is the right pronunciation? And um, yeah, some of the students already have uh, uh, yeah, the experience uh, that he is a good instructor too. In any case of a very difficult uh, res um, um, surgical approach, especially the lateral sinus floor elevation. And of course, uh, this is also his master thesis. He wants to look a little bit res retrospective in his uh, approach, in the surgical approach. And he used as a grafting material some cortical bone particles from the porcine, right? And uh, he will show us the, the results uh, of this retrospective study. Um, how it works and uh, yeah we are very happy to hear about your results about this grafting material and the discussion so the stage is on you so good afternoon um, the topic I chose for my master thesis was a retrospective evaluation on cortical porcine bone particles 
use it as uh, bone grafting material for two-state sinus augmentation procedures. And uh, as a brief introduction, I would like to say that uh, restoring the posterior maxilla with fixed crown and bridges can be very difficult and very challenging when limited amounts of bone are available and large or larger sinuses are present. In many cases, we know that the height of the available bone does not even allow for the placement of short or very short implants, which is to say six to eight millimeters long implants. We also know that the implant success rate in this specific region is the lowest, mainly due to the poor quality of the bone that uh, presents naturally in this specific topographic region, which by the way may help explain why a large number of patients uh, do not require a very long period of time under the edentulous condition to develop a massive bone loss that prevents implant placement. Um, to overcome this program, in 1986, an American dentist named Hill Tatum developed a surgical procedure of his own uh, named sinus lift, which was later on modified by another American doctors, and which is nowadays acknowledged as sinus augmentation procedure. And that uh, basically consists in raising a full thickness flap in the posterior maxilla in order to expose the lateral wall of the sinus in a round or oval shaped osteotomy just to remove the cortical bone in order to get access to the sinus membrane in the careful detachment of the sinus membrane from the underlying bone with a set of specifically designed corrects just to create a subantral space by lifting up in an upward direction the sinus membrane in an attempt to reestablish the floor of the sinus in an anatomical position that resembles pretty much the one it had when teeth were present. Later on, this uh, subantral space can be grafting using different grafting materials, which after different uh, maturation periods may allow us to insert a number of the implants that will eventually become and function as the artificial roots of our future fixture restorations. For obvious reasons, the first material used was autogenous bone, but we all know that the problems with autogenous bones are that uh, it requires a donor site from which to harvest it, but also the amount of material that can be obtained, at least temporarily, is very limited, not to mention the increase in risk, in time, in cost, and in morbidity of the extended procedure. Um, so, um, the, as an alternative, the American industry introduced it some years ago uh, a new allograft material, which is the upgraded version of the leophilized human bone, and it's uh, currently known as FDBA. FDBA are the initials that stand for freeze dry bone allograft, and they refer to the main feature of the processing technique of this allograft material because immediately after obtention of the cortical bone, of the long bone of the cadavers of the donor patient, the material is immediately submerged in a liquid nitrogen at 200 degrees below zero. This produces a very quick and extreme dehydration of the material, but that preserves the biological properties of uh, it absolutely almost intact. This, of course, makes this biomaterial extremely predictable and it is, without any doubt, our first choice when we surgeons in the United States have to pick up a material meant for GVR procedures. Um, after many years of clinical use and after a large number of uh, animal studies and human studies, the dental literature was able to show us with the uh, very good grounds that this material can be perfectly used to replace autogenous bone in the two-stage sinus augmentation procedures. Unfortunately, the problems with freeze-drive bone are that since it is so predictable, the demand of it exceeds by far the offer. And as I said before, since the industry cannot manufacture this product because it can only be obtained from the cortical bone of the long bones of the cadavers of donors, the product is commercially oftentimes in back order. And also, at least 
in the United States, we see that there is an increasing number of patients that simply refuse to have the bone of a fellow human being used for the GVR procedures. So for mainly for this reason and sometimes for some other reasons, uh, we Italians develop a cortical, a cortical peak bone made of, of a xenograft material and uh, under a proprietarian process, which after a long period of time of clinical use, and after a large number of clinical studies and human studies, also the literature was able to prove that this biomaterial can also be used for the replacement of the autogenous bone in the two-stage sinus augmentation procedure. Unfortunately, none of these materials are available in the country in which I live, which is Argentina, but the industry down there was able to develop its own proprietary process to manufacture also a xenograph material made also of pure cortical pig bone. But since the two manufacturing processes are completely different one of the other, it was my idea to test it clinically. And consequently, I developed the hypothesis that the subcortical, which is the cortical bone manufactured in Argentina, is a suitable grafting material for implant placement after two-stage sinus augmentation procedures. Uh, having that idea in mind, <laughs> Uh, I engaged 14 of my patients my, for my private practice in which 22 stage sinus augmentation procedures were performed. These patients were divided into groups. The group one was the control group in which I used the freeze dry bone allograft, the product that I use standardly in the United States. And the group two was the test group in which I used the diophilized bone xenograft, which is to say the product manufactured in Argentina. Uh, in order to validate the hypothesis, four parameters were assessed. The first one was uh, implant survival, and for implant survival, sinus augmentation procedures were performed as just described. The sinus cavities were grafted either with the allograft material and, uh, or the xenograft material. And after a six month healing period, implants were placed and counted twice. The first time when they were inserted and the second time after they had been restored and subjected to occlusal load for one year. At the, if uh, the implant was present at the second counting, it was considered that the implant survived. And uh, if the implant was not present at this counting, for obvious reason, it was considered that it didn't. The second parameter assessed was the grafted volume bone loss, because we all know that uh, all biomaterials do shrink in volume when the, after during the uh, healing process and also afterwards during the loading phase when they're used for sinus augmentation procedures. And for this, this xenograft, specific xenograft, it was established as acceptable a 30% reduction. In order to measure it, uh, I took CBCT scan slices in which uh, measurements in the three axes of the space were made twice. The first time immediately before implant placement and um, the second time after the implants had been restored and subjected to occlusal load for one year. Later on, the collected data was uh, uh, subjected to statistic anal analysis to determine its degree of significance. The third parameter established was um, the bone and tip of the implant um, <clears throat> in order to determine the proper length of each implant to be used. CVCT slices were used to measure the height of the available bone and all implants inserted were four millimeters shorter to allow for bone remodeling under the load phase. After the implants had been restored and subjected to occlusal load for one year, the bone on the tip of the implant was measured and it was established that at least two millimeter of bone should still be present because we all know from the literature that two, almost two millimeters of bone should be present all around the surface of an implant in order to allow for its long-term stability overload. And the last parameter was the biocompatibility and the osteoconductive property of this biomaterial. In order to do that, two biopsies were taken using bone trephine, one at uh, six months and the other at nine months 
after the healing process. Once they were obtained, these biopsies were submerged in 4% formalin and uh, sent to the Department of Pathology of the University of Freiburg here in Germany for processing, staining, and interpretation. From the results, we can see that out of 20 implants and after one year follow-up, 100% of uh, the patients that be belong to the group one patient, which is to say the allograft uh, patient, uh, survive. The percentage of the reduction of the volume was 31.33%, and that 71 to 75% of place implants had at least two millimeters of bone on tip of the implant. From the group two, which is to say the Senograft group, and out of 18 implants, and after one year on, under load follow-up, the cerebral rate was also 100%. The reduction of the Senograft volume was 39.13% and 68.75% of placed implants had at least two millimeters of bone on top of the tip of the implant. From these graphics, we can see that the percentage of reduction of the volume was 8% higher for the stenograph than for the allograft. And for that graphic we, of the volume, we can see that this difference was found to be statistically significant. Um, from this graphic, we can see that the number of implants that had two millimeters of bone on tip of the implant was higher for the allograft than for the stenograph, but this difference was found to be statistically not significant. From the results of the biopsy, we can see that at six months, we still can see the remnants of the originally grafted material that un are undergoing a very active resorption process and they're mostly surrounded by new bone with no evidence of aberrant tissue reaction. At, at nine months, we can see that most of the particles have been reabsorbed and replaced by mature bone, but with no evidence of any foreign body reaction. As a conclusion, we can see that uh, tissue cortical is a xenograft biomaterial with highly biocompatible and osteoconductive properties that's almost fully reabsorbed after nine months. We can also say that it's an appropriate biomaterial to be used as a replacement of autogenous bone for the two-stage lateral sinus augmentation procedure due to its inherent ability to be replaced by the host bone. We can also say that the quantity and the quality of the newly formed bone allows for important values of initial stability of implants, assuring very high cerebral rates over time. And due to its inherent biological metabolism, a significant reduction of the original grafted volume of the biomaterial is to be expected. And finally, the magnitude of this reduction should be taken into consideration when selecting the size of the implant to be used particularly the length of it, as the height of the newly formed bone is the parameter that is reduced the most. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, thank you very much, Gustavo, uh, that you present the results and the approach <laughs> of your master thesis. Uh, we do it also in other um, um, congresses here of the MOI. Is there any question opening for discussion? It's a little bit hard to read. Yeah. No, no, but this is not my presentation. I don't know what happened. I didn't prepare it like this. I just gave to Nina the presentation. This is not my presentation. Ah, okay. So uh, perhaps they have not the font. And, yeah, uh, This is not working. Okay, no, no yeah. problem. Yeah, this can happen. Sorry for that. So the first question. First of all, we want to congratulate uh, please you. Please stop. Uh, Microphone, please. Yeah, it's not working. Yes, now it's working. First of all, we want to co congratulate you, Gustavo. <laughs> we are proud of you, MY16. And my question is, um, what is the reason of shrinkage uh, that you recognize the reduction of the volume of the bone? Well, I think it's because uh, one of the materials is not fully reabsorbable like the free stray bone, and the other one is fully reabsorbable. 
um, all materials that are not completely reabsorbable, they require to have somehow some bone around the H particle because they are biocompatible particles. So in that way, the final volume with, will be always be higher in a material that has remnants than compared with another material that don't have remnants. General question from Pablo. Also use it uh, for one stage sinus flow elevation. This is, no, this is uh, for two stages. Uh, the biomaterial, yes, it was also, yes, it was not, it was beyond the scope of my thesis, but yes, of course, we use it for one state science segmentation procedure, yes, for one state, yeah. Sorry? For GBR, did you use it for the GBR, the guide monitoring? This biomaterial, yes, it's also very predictable, and but do, it's not, do you mix it with the but it's not, it's not as predictable when you compare it with the freeze dry bone. Our standard uh, material is the freeze ray bone because it's extremely predictable. Okay. And now, okay. lately, all the more that because we use it with uh, PRP. But do you, do you mix it with the uh, autogenous bone? Or so? No, we never use autogenous bone. Mm. Yes. My understanding is um, that you're placing implants shorter say four millimeters or so shorter than the uh, yes. superior extension of the, of the sinus elevation. That's correct. Due to a resorption, say a couple of millimeters resorption over time. Um, do you think there's any real concern that if the implant is extended to the extent of the graft, um, that it would cause any negative effect or would we just get remodeling around the apex? That, that, that's a very good question because uh, my concern of uh, this problem having enough bone on top of the tip of the implant start when I start working with my ENT guy, the guy that fixed the sinus when we have problems. And the thing that is uh, that uh, in those cases when the sinus membrane is just extremely attached to the tip of the implant and the patient get uh, infectious sinusitis, the surface so treated of the implant become as a harbor, a nest, to a permanent infection in the patient. So nowadays, all the ENT guys uh, are not happy what we're doing in the sinus because once the patient gets an infection, it's very, re it's very if almost impossible to, for the patient not to have repeated sinusitis. So they send the patient back. So please trim the tip of the implant and try to level it with the bone. So it's becoming a critical factor to have this uh, at least limited amount of bone on the tip of the implant to assure not only the long-term stability of the implant, but also not to get involved with the sinus problem. Because it's very difficult from the clinical standpoint uh, to explain a patient why he, the, the ENT guy can get rid of uh, a, a ENT problem. And uh, when the, the doctor send uh, uh, the patient back to our office, uh, it's very difficult to explain what we have done. So it's just a preemptive measure to make sure that we really like to have uh, implants and after MOI, I think I start using shorter and shorter implants to allow for more bone on top of my implants. Because so you mean, do you mean what uh, was he say? He was saying if a, if there was a, a protection layer. A protection yes, that's layer. why I'm trying to do. Yes, protection layer. Yes, of to bone. To protect against should be. That's the way. Information from the sinus. Yes. I just add to that. Um, is this on? Um, the resorption rate of the uh, sinus graft will obviously depend on the material itself. Um, I don't know the, if there's any research uh, on, this, on this opinion that I'm about to make, but um, I found I use BioWAS for this purpose, and uh, it seems to be quite volume stable. And quite often uh, the uh, osseo, um, in, well, the uh, osseous deposit is, is more dense uh, towards the Schneiderian membrane and towards the periphery of the graft than towards the center. Yes. So I make a goal of actually engaging the end of that. What are your thoughts on BIOS and its volume stability? No, we don't use BIOS because uh, regarding this problem, it's completely solved. You will ne if you use BIOS, you will never have this problem because BIOS is a slowly resorbable biomaterial, but it's so slowly uh, Resorbable biomaterial that uh, so when you. So slow that the patient died before. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, no. Yes, of course, no. Um, I like around my implants 
in a, the specific sinus situation, a biomaterial that can that can perfectly adjust to the functional requirements. And it's a proven fact from the Italians that when you get these composite materials over time, all you are doing is impairing the electric information that the bone requires to be maintained over time. I don't like those composite materials. I prefer a material that uh, is quickly and easily resorbed. We know from the literature, from the biopsies, of, that the freeze-dry bone still leaves some remnants, but those remnants are never over 20%. The rest of the 80% is still uh, the patient's own bone. Okay. Coming from Argentina. So, yeah, and then we open the short coffee break. Thank you.